that my throat's a little scratchy this service, as you may notice, and it reminds me of one of my favorite lectures, which some of you may want to get out of here as soon as possible and may really like. <laughs> it's the, the Zen teacher, Richard Baker, who took the stage, and his speech was just a few words. He said, there is nothing to be said. And walked off. <laughs> That's pretty cool, isn't it? <laughs> so I will be, for some of you, taking a little longer today. So our talk this morning for Easter is Jesus' message for today. And I think that's a really good question to ask ourselves, especially when we look at some of the challenges that we face as humankind, as a nation, and as individuals. There's a pretty long list of major challenges out there, aren't there? And uh, I was even joking in the last service, I don't always like to bring them up here because sometimes coming here is a break from all those things going on in the news. But I think it's important from time to time to address these things and what we can do from our little sacred seat here in our art tool by the sea. So one of the major challenges facing us is climate change, correct? You know, environmental concerns. Uh, the fact seems to be that we're going to have to find creative new ways of living and being together as community, no matter what. The economy is something that usually everyone's complaining about. You have this hybrid of different ideas, and rich people are angry, and poor people are angry, and folks in the middle wonder if there's still such thing as a ladder to get up, or if there's a safety net underneath them if they fall. And then perhaps most concerning right now, or most heart-aching, is this religious fundamentalism, this extremism that we see taking place around the world, but in particular in the Middle East and in Africa. Last week, just this last week, Al-Shabaab in Kenya, some militants, Islamic militants, walked into a dorm and asked the students, if they were Muslim, they let them go. If they were Christian, they executed them. Almost 150 people. Just the week before that, Boko Haram in Nigeria kidnapped 400 kids from their school, a whole school. This is different than that, what you may have read in the news a year or so ago. So it's heartbreaking to see this type of extremism taking place and how we can address it. Of course, this religious extremism takes other forms that are not near as tragic or drastic, but still concerning. Um, in Middle Eastern countries, and in Africa in particular, it's everywhere as well, the subjugation of women still goes on in intensely tragic and concerning ways. Across Europe right now, hate crimes against Muslims and Jews are on the rise. In our own country, we've been faced to have more and more conversations about race relations as well as conversations about laws that may discriminate against someone because of their gender or sexual orientation. So it's a pretty long list of challenges out there, isn't it? And I go on, but I do want to give an inspirational talk today. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I do want to talk about, about Easter. Because something that I love about our center here is we see a need for the greatest wisdom that has ever been. And we don't discriminate based upon what culture or religion that wisdom may have come from. So I love that we can apply the wisdom that Lao Tzu gave to our lives today, that the Buddha gave to our lives today, and that Jesus gave to our life and how to live today. Now what's happened, as I'll get to, is a lot of times these teachers' great teachings have been twisted. They've been used to let people think they're more special or better than other people, or that they have a special channel to the divine. And as we'll talk about, I think that's the exact opposite of what Jesus' message was. So in our teaching, we believe in the natural Jesus, Jesus who was a man and who sought to reform his own religion of Judaism, and also understood and taught incredibly deep and profound teachings on faith, on forgiveness, and on the nature of God. We also believe in the mystical Christ, 
or what we might call the risen Christ. This is something that we believe the story of the resurrection really points to, the idea that the Christ consciousness, the Father's kingdom, is something that is available that any of us can discover and cultivate within if we're willing to believe, if we're willing to practice and experience the Holy Spirit as something that is right here and right now. I love that bumper sticker, you know, what would Jesus do? I think it's a great question to ask about the challenges of today. But if I understand Jesus very well, I think his counter question would be, don't be concerned about what I would do. What will you do? What are you going to do about the challenges that face the world today? How are you going to respond? So I love the bumper sticker, what would Jesus do? Not maybe as much as Jesus, please save me from your followers, which can work sometimes. <laughs> it speaks to the idea that many times the teachings of some of the great, greatest religious figures of all time have been used not to bring together, but to make one above or better than another. Our book of the month is called Convictions by Marcus Bohr, who's one of my favorite Jesus and Bible scholars. And he recently passed away just a couple months ago. And his book is called Convictions, How I Learn What Matters Most. And he makes a distinction between what he would call conservative Christianity, which I would probably prefer to call you know, radical or fundamentalist Christianity, and uh, progressive Christianity. He says that conservative Christianity is where folks believe that the Bible is, is an errant doctrine, that it doesn't contain metaphors or stories, that it's all to be taken as literal. Conservative Christianity generally believes as well that our central relationship with God has to do with sin, with absolution of sin. And there's a focus as well on the afterlife and our relationship with Jesus having to do with procuring a place for us in heaven after we die. Progressive Christianity tells us, which is something I really resonate, I don't know about you, he says that progressive Christianity sees the Christian scriptures as sacred texts, yet also ones that are open to interpretation, contain metaphors, and ideas about how to live the inner life. For progressive Christianity, salvation isn't about transforming life after death, but it's about transforming our life and our world today. And progressive Christianity views our relationship with God as one of unconditional love. The idea that the love of God is foreign and not unavailable to anyone who is willing to say yes and receive it. One of Jesus' central teachings is that of, of faith. And to me, it's such a powerful teaching in the sense that the faith he's talking about isn't the faith we tend to embrace in the common sense today that says that faith is about belief in the unseen, this belief in what can't be proven scientifically, for example. For Jesus and Jesus' teachings, faith is about awareness of God, not belief in, but your faith is something about your everyday energy, your everyday being. It's your awareness of the presence of God with you. And so often Jesus is teaching to his disciples and to everyone around him is, oh, you of little faith. Some of us forget sometimes that Jesus isn't the only person to walk on water in the Bible. Peter walks on the water too. Jesus is walking on the water and it surprises the disciples, it would surprise me too. What do you up to, Jesus? <laughs> but he's teaching a lesson about faith, is the metaphor of the story. And Peter says, can I try? And Jesus says, sure, come on out. And Peter steps onto the water, and he's of faith. He has awareness of God, creativity, passion, and fire with him. Isn't that great in our own lives when we step into the unknown or step into the mystery or step into facing a circumstance or a trial? And we do so with the faith of the divine, the faith that the Father and ourselves are one. So he's doing really good there for a little while, but then he notices how windy it is. 
and he sees how choppy the tide is. And so he starts to sink. And doesn't this happen to us sometimes in life as well? We start off with a consciousness of faith, a consciousness of unity, a consciousness of confidence, but then, ah, we start to get freaked out. We slip into the judgments of the past and limited beliefs about what we're capable of, and we start sinking. Lord, please save me, <laughs> Peter says. Oh, you of little faith, Jesus responds and pulls him out of the water. And isn't that us sometimes as well when we're sinking? Please, Lord, help me. And at times we've experienced that sense of being saved by a faith and presence greater than ourselves. What impresses me most about Peter, even though he kind of fails in a sense, is at least he gave it a shot, right? I think that's the number one problem with a lot of these issues that face us as people, is that we kind of have that culture of denial sometimes. We don't face some of these circumstances with faith and trust, but we you know, turn the other cheek in a bad way. We don't confront them. We see this in something like climate change, where we have all the climate change deniers out there, right? But then we also have you know, those of us, too, who says to ourselves, oh, you know, what is what recycling on my own behalf going to do? Do I really have to stop using my curing cups or whatever it is that we read in the news? But we see that we have a, a role to play in this type of creating a community that works for everyone. When it comes to this radical religious fundamentalism out there, I think what a lot of people do, and I know I do it from time to time, is I listen to the news and I hear about the people being murdered and I think to myself, gosh, I can't believe that's happening way over there. I can't believe that happened all the way out there in Africa. Knows I haven't even gotten to ISIS yet. Or I'll even say to myself in the Middle, you know, in the Middle East, it's like they live in the 12th century, as if our troops go through a time machine to kind of go back there. But Jesus' message is that God loves everyone, that God's presence is everywhere, and so it's not exclusive. So this violence is happening in our Father's house. It's happening in our very backyards. These are our brothers and sisters who are being murdered, and this is the ignorance and terrorism of many people, too, who you know, call themselves whatever names that they do, performing this violence as well. So it's important sometimes not only to have compassion for those who are being tortured by this violence, but to also hold in our hearts this idea that the spirit is something that is there for everyone. And this is one of the central understandings of Jesus' message, that his message isn't just for Jewish people, it's not even for Buddhist people or for Christian people. You never even use the word Christian. And the idea is that it's for everyone. I love something that Gandhi said about Jesus, not a traditional Christian. Jesus expressed as no other could the spirit and will of God. It is in this sense that I see him and recognize him as the son of God. <clears throat> and because the life of Jesus has the significance and the transcendency to which I have alluded, I believe that he belongs not solely to Christianity, but to the entire world, to all races, and to all people. So does this mean we should just love folk over on until they stop, or, or send loving thoughts to ISIS? Well, in some ways, yes. You know, I love something that philosopher Bertrand Russell said. He said that the prime minister of his time was a great Christian, but I wouldn't suggest slapping him on the cheek. <laughs> You know, maybe even Je Jesus wouldn't have thought himself to be a great general. Sometimes we have to respond with a strong love that says, you know, not in our house, not in our home, not in our world. So sometimes we have to face these issues with force, but it doesn't mean that we can't still hold a consciousness for a greater love and understanding for our brothers and sisters across the world. I had a great experience with a congregant a couple weeks ago. Her name is Pauline, and she lives locally here, and she asked me to come over to her house. And I, and I really like that, because she sat me down, and she made me tea, and she brought me cookies. 
and we did these very thin wafer cookies, and she even brought some vanilla frosting. And so I got to very meditatively put them on, <laughs> enjoy, and drink the tea. Pretty cool perk of the job, right? <laughs> and Pauline is an elder, and for me, a pretty powerful person. She's closer to 100 than she is to 50, let me say that. But she said, Josh, I want to tell you that I really believe that thoughts are things. And that if we can cultivate and nurture a thought, that we can send and perhaps affect some of the less fortunate, fortunate with that thought and uplift them. And I had a great idea, she told me, that you know that Seal Beach 10K run? What if everyone just took a minute or two and sent a prayer for ISIS? Sent a prayer for these individuals to wake up from their ignorance, to realize a greater truth about their own dignity, much less to keep them from robbing others of their dignity. And my first thought was a little egotistical, and I was thinking that the run was the week before, so it was too late. <laughs> because there was that part of me that said, oh gosh, if I brought up that idea, people might think I'm really airy-fairy, and here's some hippie idea of sending love thoughts to ISIS. <laughs> but as I, I listened to her, I, I realized that she was a much stronger person than I am, and much more of a person of faith in that sense. Here's this little old lady, we might say, <coughs> wanting and claiming her ability to make a difference in the world, yeah. if only through sending a positive thought somewhere. And that's the promise of the mystical Christ, is the myst mystical Christ isn't something that separates us, that makes some better than others, or sends some to heaven and some to hell. It is the very avenue in which we experience our brotherhood and our sisterhood, our oneness with the divine. Sometimes we just want to focus on doing the best we can with what's in front of us. And that's, again, a great difficulty that comes up when it comes to how overwhelming the problems of the world are. We have to ask ourselves, what is it that I can do? And I think the best piece of advice is to do what's in front of you. To recognize that caring for those around you, that loving those around you, that doing acts of goodwill for those around you can indeed create a ripple. And I do think it's through these creative acts that we have such a thing as the internet, or as education, that's going to some of these places where we find so much ignorance, and even in our own country where we may be experiencing some ignorance, we have some great-minded people that are stirring the pot and waking us up. I love something that Alan Turing said, who's come back into the spotlight because of a movie released about him last year, and Alan Turing was a uh, gay man who was a codebreaker for the British during World War II. And he, broke some of the codes that helped lead to the war. So you could argue that if one person won the war for the Allies, it may have been Alan Turing. Um, Alan Turing was given up as gay, which was a crime in Britain at the time, and given a hormone therapy that began to cause him to regress and he ultimately kill himself. Uh, but he has a great quote, uh, and I think he was well in accordance with this. He said, we can only see a short distance ahead, but we can see plenty there that needs to be done. We can only see a short distance ahead, but we can see plenty there that needs to be done. We may not be able to ensure a perfectly safe world for everyone, but that's no excuse for not trying, right? Borg says in his book, Convictions, loving what God loves, participating in God's passion for a different kind of world, includes becoming passionate about God's dream, a world of fairness in which everybody has enough of the material basis of existence and in which there is no violence or war. Utopian? Yes. Impossible to achieve in its fullness? Probably. But can there be a greater approximation of it? Yes. Only the privileged who wish to defend their privilege, or the victimized who have given up anything really changing and resigned themselves to their fate, might say no. But for Christians who take the Bible and Jesus seriously, it is the only world worth dreaming about and striving toward. Loving God means participating in God's passion for that kind of world. I love something that Martin Luther King, someone who expressed the principles of Christ in his public life, perhaps better than anyone else in the last hundred years, he, he said that central to Jesus' teaching was that Jesus offered us a new definition of greatness. A new definition of what it means to be great. And he resources the Gospel of Mark, where John and James, they want to be Jesus' pals. They're really stoked to be his disciples. And so 
They say, Jesus, will you give us whatever we wish for? You know, kind of like Veruca in Willy Wonka in the Chocolate Factory type of, I want a golden goose type of thing. And this is a good definition of how a lot of religions get twisted. Because it's the idea of how can I use this faith to make me first? To get me to the front of the line to get into heaven. To make me above my fellow man as opposed to one with my fellow man and woman. Luckily, Jesus doesn't respond with, yes, sure. He says to them that he can't grant that request. But that's up to their works. Jesus says to them, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for the many. And King explains this. He says, Jesus gave a new norm of greatness. If you want to be important, wonderful. If you want to be recognized, wonderful. If you want to be great, wonderful. But recognize that he who is greatest among you shall be your servant. That's a new definition of greatness. And I think that's at the heart of what Jesus' message for today is. Is how can we lift up ourselves through being of service to others? How can we practice more compassion in our relationships? How can we practice more openness to those we may have judgments about? And at the same time maintain our boundaries, our convictions, our principles? How can we best serve the calling or the sense of deep, profound truth in our hearts on an everyday basis? To close with some words from Borg, imagine that Christianity is about loving God. Imagine that it's not about the self and its concerns, about what's in it for me, neither that be a blessed afterlife or prosperity in this life. Imagine that loving God is about being attentive to the one in whom we live and move and have our being. Imagine that it is about becoming more and more deeply centered in God. Imagine that it is about loving what God loves. Imagine how that would change our lives. Imagine how it would change American Christianity in its relation to American politics and economics and our relationship to the rest of the world. The humanly created world might, could, and should be life. So let us not celebrate a resurrection that happened thousands of years ago, but a rebirthing in our hearts today of that mystical Christ, that energy that knows and is within us even when we don't know. And all we need to do is call upon it. It is that golden thread that every great spiritual master is taught of that is never meant to make one more divine than he already is, but to help him realize his divinity in connection with all who are around him. So I thank you for your time this morning, and happy Easter.